Let's see, I guess uh, should be Matthew 22, 11 through 14 on the screen. Is that up there yet? If not, I'm going to read that myself. Um, Oh yeah, here we are. It's a parable uh, that Jesus was uh, uh, saying, and and these four verses, they've um, uh, the whole parable is actually Matthew twenty, uh, in Matthew twenty two one through fourteen, but it's these these verses right here that always bothered me, and it was when the king came in to see these guests. He sees this man which hadn't uh, didn't have a wedding garment on. He said unto him, friend. How'd you get in here? You didn't have a wedding garment, and the guy didn't have an excuse. And the king says to his servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus concludes, for many are called, but few are chosen. And, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, if, if, if the whole thing is Matthew 22, uh, 1 through 14, but if, if, and I'm going to talk about that, but if, if, if Stephen were trying to Put it all on the screen and just scrunch down so small he probably couldn't read it anyway. But you can get your Bibles out anyway. Uh, uh, and I, I know that's such a Stone Age suggestion. Get your Bibles out and read it. You know that's no. You know we, don't, we read it off the screen these days. But anyway, see these particular verses. They when I was a kid they bothered me. Uh, you know, how in the world do I know for positive that I'm not the guy with the wrong wedding garment? You know, uh, what if Jesus talk about me? What if there's some small print in the scriptures that I don't know anything about that uh, when I breathe my last breath, isn't this scary? I'm going to die now. My heart's just, you know, slowing down, getting ready to, you know, I'm getting ready to cack. And what am I going to find when I wake up on the other side? Heaven or hell? See, it's a scary proposition because it's permanent. Whatever you find, that's what you got. All right. Okay. And so, uh, you know, and, and then Jesus, it, I mean, it's a warning too. You know, uh, uh, many are called, but few are chosen. Uh, you know, and your eyes start to wiggle, you know, especially when you're a kid like me, you know, I, it did me, you know, it's a reasonable worry. You know, Jesus is issuing a warning here, you know, and so, hey, you know, a person might think he's just fine with God, but he might be completely mistaken, and it's a fatal mistake. You can't make this mistake. You got to know. And so anyway, this guy, here he is, he sits down at the feast, he thinks he's okay, you know, he's, uh, he figures he's going to be welcome there, he figures that, uh, you know, he's okay. He's just as okay as the guy sitting next to him. <clears throat> and, uh, he, you know, he expects to be welcome there. And then here comes the king himself. And and he looks the guy over. <laughs> he just tosses him out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and the guy, it didn't look like the guy expected that. He expected to be received. And he wasn't. Hey, you know, what? what's going on? You know, what a shocking disappointment for this guy. And more to the point. And here's the real point, you see. Could that guy be me? You know, I think, you know, I thought that. I think that occasionally, even now, you know, I get kind of shook up. Oh, you know, am I, the only, am I the only guy here that's bothered? You know, does anybody, does anybody ever, does your eyeballs, does anybody's eyeballs ever twitch? You know, when they read these scriptures and you look at Lord, you know, I'd, I'd like to be, a, I'd like, I'd like to be a little more secure, see. And so anyway, well, you know what? Uh, hey, am I that guy? The guy without the right robe. All uh, right. See, and the thing is, see, when a person believes there's such a thing as hell, you want to make sure that you're on the right, the right side. And, uh, you know, I find it easier to believe in hell than heaven. It's just my nature. You know, I always, you know, I'm not surprised at bad news. <laughs> you know, that happens. And so it, it's easy for me to believe in, in hell. Uh, you know, I feel that that's my rightful and true home. But... On the other hand, Jesus said, if you trust in me, then you won't go there. Now, okay, but that's easy to believe in, and trusting in Jesus is work. We've talked about that, right? That's hard. So, anyway, better do our homework now. You know, there's still time to change things. That makes sense, see? So the guy, 
in the wrong robe. In a way, see, we've been talking about this for the last six weeks anyway. And so uh, all the other parts of this parable have to do with the Jewish kingdom, the temple, and all that's going to be lost. And, you know, and, and the, uh, uh, that spiritual water carrying, this is what this is about, that happens in the world is going to be done by the Gentiles. The Jews, they're done. All right? You know, they're re rejecting Christ. But to get to these verses, we have to go back and see what happened before because context, right? See, back in chapter 21 of this book, Jesus had ridden into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, presenting himself as the rightful king. That's what had happened. He had the, he, he had the genealogy. He had the, he had the prophetic credentials. He had the miraculous credentials. You know, he's able to do miracles. And he had popularity. And so he approaches Jerusalem, see, on Palm Sunday, exactly as the prophecies had indicated that he would. He did that. So here it comes. But what he didn't have, what he didn't bring with himself, uh, with him, was an army. Didn't have an army. And what he was doing was presenting the leader, the Jewish leadership, and the Jewish population as a whole, the, the Israel, Israel as a whole, he was presenting them with a choice. See, if he'd brought an army, there wouldn't have been a choice, would there? You know, he's the king because he's got an army. And now Jesus could have brought all his angels with him, and that would have settled the matter. But he didn't do that. He came in, he, and so, and so he, he came according to the prophecy in Zechariah 9, 9. You can look it up if you want, but that's where this comes from. But here is the problem with the temple leadership. See, uh, right now, at this moment in time, their position is secured in, by being in control of the temple. That, that position is secure because they bribe the Romans. It's dependent on the Romans. See, and the Romans are, you know, the people hate the Romans, but these guys are actually benefited by the Roman dominion over Israel. They paid for the privilege of putting their high priest, Caiaphas' high priest, Caiaphas was high priest, it's Ananias' family actually, but their high priest in control of the temple. That was by permission of Rome. That's not right, but that's what happened. And so it was the Romans allowed who was going to be the high priest, and they were bribed into it. All right. So, and the reason they bought the, the, the privilege, Caiaphas' family bought the privilege, because they, they were making a fortune off the temple. You know, you know these money changers and all that that Jesus was throwing out. You know, that, that you remember, Jesus threw out the money changers at the beginning of his ministry. And then in the last chapter, he just threw them out again. And so uh, they didn't forget that. That was, they were fabulously wealthy. And so if, G, if they had a king, obviously it's going to set up, upset that apple cart for them. That's not going to work. Okay, and so uh, he represents a new administration, Jesus did. And his administration had been in the past openly hostile remember the money changers thrown out right to that to to their control of the temple now the sadducees don't believe in the resurrection anyway and so they're not worried about punishment or anything like that they don't care hey, what so what jesus is saying actually has nothing you know they don't have it doesn't have any meaning to them it didn't uh so in caiaphas see he was the high priest that year and he says in john 11 49 and 50 he said, uh, well, it's better for one man to die than rather than the whole nation to perish. See, it was their position with the Romans that they were worried about. You know, Caiaphas' family was all about the money. You know, all about the position. Okay. Now, the P Pharisees were a different, a whole different can of worms. They're different. Their problems were different. As far as the Pharisees are concerned, see, and before he was an apostle, that this included Paul, too. Okay, uh, Jesus is a direct threat to their status. They had high status in, in Jewish society. And so uh, what he, he, and so Jesus, what Jesus represented in his person was, was the exact opposite of what they taught. For them, see, spiritual, spirituality was bought and sold in terms of what you studied, who you studied under, how much you knew of the scriptures, how clever you were with the scriptures. That was all, that was, that was, their status depended on that stuff, right? Okay, and so, uh, 
how well you observed the customs when you washed your hands, if you started with your pinky finger, and you know, who knows what it was, you know, I don't know. I, you know, I've heard, I read it before, and you, you just, you know, it's one of those things you don't bother remembering, other than there's a certain, um, you know, certain way you wash your hands, you gotta have one eggshells full of water, blah, 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 you know, and all that stuff, okay. But their status depended on it, all right? And so, uh, you know, Jesus even mentioned that. Uh, and see, even though the apostles had bought into this, Jesus' apostles were influenced by these guys. Because even on the night of the Lord's Supper, the night of the betrayal, they were still bickering over who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You know, I'd be happy to just get in. You know, that's good enough. But that, that wasn't their case. You know, they, they didn't think in terms like that. Okay, so both of these groups, see, as much as they despised each other, they stood this, together on this. And they told Jesus, it ain't happening, buddy. That's not, you're not going to be king around here. See, it, it, by this time, they were mad enough. To, they had been plotting his death. They were plotting his murder. And so this is, the, uh, this is the background for the parable that begins in Matthew chapter 22. This is the background. This is what Jesus is talking about. He's talking on the steps of the temple. He's talking to these people. Okay. So Jesus answered, see the answer, that's just King James, you know, he's announcing, he's preaching, answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, day after Palm Sunday, he's thrown down the money changers, he's in front of a very excited crowd, but today the chief priests and the elders, they had gathered around uh, because they were going to cost Jesus about this, about what he had done. So Jesus has, it's a crowd of Jews. The leadership and the, and the common people and the people they're all excited about the supposed coming of the king and the advent of the kingdom of israel and the one who fed the five thousand you know this is going to be one good time if we can get this guy to be king we got it made we can all retire okay anyway the end of roman oppression so this is all concerning the kingdom so jesus says the kingdom of heaven here's what it's like like to a certain king which made a marriage for his son that's verse two and the Jews aren't stupid. They, they understand the scriptures. Okay. And then they're, uh, they're fully aware that Jesus has claimed to be the son of God. In fact, they tried to stone him for it before. Okay. In other places. And so when he talked about the king and his son, they understood Jesus was talking about God, the father and himself. He, they, they knew that. They, they got it. And so um, uh, they knew that Israel, for instance, is called the wife of Jehovah. They called, you know, so, so the relationship between God and his people is compared to a marriage frequently. Okay, and they understood that. So here, Jesus is calling himself the bridegroom. <laughs> they understood what he was saying, and they didn't like it. They weren't going for it. And so anyway, Jesus continues in verse 3, sends forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they wouldn't come. They didn't, right? Well, they're not coming right there on the steps of the temple, in fact. They would not come. That's what he's saying. Okay. And so, uh, again, he sends forth other servants. But actually, this is kind of a historical thing, too. Because he's saying, this has happened, and it's happened, and it's happening. Okay. They would. And so, again, he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which were bidden. Behold, I've prepared my dinner. Remember that? Ho, oh, you're thirsty and all that. You know, uh, my oxen, my fatlings are killed. All things are, are, they're ready. All you have to do is come through the door. Right? It's an invite. It's a choice. Come or not come. It's in, hey, you know, and here's Isaiah, you know, 55 and 1. This is the invite. It's given all the way back in the Old Testament. Ho, oh, everybody, th you thirsty? Hey, well, I got water. Uh, you, you know, you're broke? Come anyway. You know, uh, there's wine, there's milk, there's no money needed. And with a, it, there's no price on this. It's free, right? See, it's a call to a wedding feast is what this is. And at a wedding feast, who pays for the party? The guy that throwing the feast. The people, the guests don't pay for that. Right? It's the doors are open. Come in. You got an invite? Come in. And see, and so the guests don't pay. And God, in this case, he God himself is throwing the party, and he's the one footing the bill. And he did. His own blood and his own body. Okay, we know that. All right. So how good does it have to be? All right, we know this is a pretty good invite. So the invite goes out, and it's an invitation, but you gotta understand too. 
if we get an invite from the king, it's not just an invite either. It's also a command. All right. Now it's, an, it's couched as an in, invitation, but there's more to it than that. He's king too. And so I'm buying, the food's on me. Here's how it goes. I'm buying, the food's on me, and y'all better be there. Be sure to come. Okay? And it's a great honor to be invited to the marriage supper of the prince. It's, and it's really rude to refuse such an invite. Now, you'd think that everybody would be crowding through these doors right now. Obviously, they're not. Right? That's not right. Okay. So, Matthew 22, 5 through 7. See, and they, they, they make light of it. That's, you know, that's that rock of offense, that stone of stumbling. Oh, Jesus. You know, whatever floats your boat, whatever makes you happy, you guys go ahead and believe that. Blah, blah, blah. But these are Jews. Okay, and they know better. And so they go their ways. He, guy goes, he gets busy. He does other things. He doesn't give any thought to the invite. One guy goes to his farm. The you know, guy has a store. And not only that, the remnant took his, and this is the historical part of it, the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Which of the prophets did your fathers not kill? Jesus had accused them before. So you guys killed the prophets. King hears about it. This is Jesus talking now. And he's mad. He sends forth his armies and he destroys these murderers and burned up their city. Not only did it happen in the past, it's getting ready to happen again. And in AD 70, so it did. All right, city burned up, Jews dispersed, ground soaked with salt. In fact, it was forbidden by the Romans for any Jew to inhabit Jerusalem again on pain of death. You can't go back. If we catch any Jews there, we're going to kill you. Okay. So this is where we stand. Now. See, Jesus just presented himself as the rightful king of Israel. They could have accepted him as king with all the blessings, and like the prophecies were written, all kinds of blessings. But the parable was also historical. All right. And as a result, you know, God did, in fact, just send armies, send Nebuchadnezzar, destroy Israel, got it rebuilt again, getting ready to be destroyed again. And so, uh, uh, and he fills in more details in the Olivet Discourse. Uh, that's fine. The Jews aren't worthy. And so that's it. And so he destroyed those murders and burned up their city. And then in verse 22 and 8 and, uh, eight and 10, he says, look, <clears throat> he tells his servants, the wedding is ready. But those guys that I invited, they weren't even worthy to come. Cause they, and, and what made them not worthy? Simply the fact they didn't come through the door. That was what made them unworthy. They weren't worthy. Not only that, they sneered at the invite. And so, and so they which were bidden, they, they're not worthy. So go ye therefore here into the highways, as many as ye shall find. Doesn't matter. Bid to the marriage. So the servants did. They go out, according to Jesus. They go into the highways, gather together all as many as they could find, both good and bad. Good and bad, you see that part in there? Good and bad, doesn't matter. So worthiness doesn't have anything to do with the invite. Okay. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And they came in. These guys came in. See, in these next verses, see, Jesus predicts the turning away by God from the Jewish nation. So, all right, fine. And so, uh, and it was predicted by the prophets like uh, in Isaiah 65, 1 and 2. And, and Jesus is saying he's going to turn to the Gentiles. See, that's that part about the highways and byways. You know, that's how, you know, uh, you know you, if you don't want what I have to offer you, that's fine. And they which were invited were not worthy because they didn't want it. They weren't worthy because they didn't value the invitation. And it wasn't because they were especially sinful or anything like that. Because the, both the good and the bad were invited and came into the wedding. It was just that when they finally met God face to face, these people were talking to God face to face. That's Jesus. And they didn't like what they saw. They didn't want God. Jesus was not what they wanted. So God, he opens the invitation to the Gentile nations in Isaiah 65 and 1. That's, part, that's the part where Jesus said the servants went into the highways, the main roads, everywhere. In other words, everywhere where people gather, you know, wherever you find the people. 
And no matter who, you invite him to come, see? So Jesus is prophesying at this point. This is what's going to happen now that you've rejected me, okay, and God in the flesh from being your king. The Gentiles are going to take your place. All right. So the servants, they went out, and Jesus is careful to note that the invite was to everybody, irrespective of spiritual condition, how much they knew, whatever education they had, how smart they were, anything else, good and bad, it's open. We have a song to that effect, whosoever will. Hear the invitation, whosoever will. Well, it is. Whosoever means exactly that, whosoever. The invite's universal. So they did come. A lot of people, a lot of Gentiles, mainly Gentiles. Like Moses said in Deuteronomy 32 and 21, you provoke me to jealousy by worshiping these idols? Well, I am going to provoke you to jealousy by a foolish nation, <laughs> spiritually foolish. That's the Gentiles. That's us. That's where we come in, see? So anyway, that brings us now to the verses that were so worrisome to me as a kid. That's these. The king comes in to see the guest. There's a man, didn't have a wedding garment. He says to him, friend, check that friend, by the way. He says, how come you don't have a wedding garment? How'd you get in here? And he, he didn't have an excuse. And then the king says to the servants, tie him up, throw him out. And... Uh, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's going to hell. If for many are called, the few are chosen. Okay. Now keep in mind, Jesus is primarily talking to the Jews at this moment. But we come into this too. So he's talking to us also. There's no Gentiles in his audience. Uh, the Gentiles weren't even allowed past the court of the Gentiles into the temple courtyard. He's talking to strictly Jews and the Jewish nation. And you see that little bit about the king calling the man friend? Well, the reason, the call, see, the king is calling the man his comrade or his fellow. There's a close association. There's an association between the king and this man. The man's not a Gentile. He's Jewish. Okay? He's a Jewish man. He's acquainted with the law and with God. See, Jesus had just told the leaders that they were going to lose their place at the wedding feast to the Gentiles. So now the scene shifts to the feast itself. It's not just a feast. See, because each and every person there has a robe on. It's a garment, a wedding dress, right? This is the, this is the bride. This is what these people are invited. They're part of the bride, okay? Now everybody, if everybody good or bad has, is wearing one of these, then these robes got to be easy to obtain. And of course they were. They had to have been provided by the king. All expenses on the king. You know, he's the one providing them. And so, you know, so good and bad includes rich or poor. See, these, these garments obviously were provided by the king. And so what was this one solitary guy doing without a garment? Well, obviously he thought his own clothes were good enough. Your clothes. Well... <laughs> you know, he thought he'd be welcome because he's Jewish or other people think they're welcome for other for similar reasons but in this case Jewish but the application is wider than just the Jews right okay and that was his problem see you know, his problem is the exact same problem as the chief priests and the elders and the scribes and the Pharisees and the common Jewish person see each of these guys with few exceptions comparatively and there's a lot of them that, that did believe but but in terms of the national population, only a few out of the Jewish population did come to faith in Christ. Anyway, they think that their own righteousness is sufficient coverage, uh, sufficient covering to allow them to enter into heaven. I'm good enough because I've done, like Paul said, I did the law. I did it all without fail, but it wasn't good enough. Yeah. Anyway, so each and every one of these guys, including Paul himself, the apostle, was wrong they were wrong and jesus is telling them so you're not good enough you guys think you're holy so holy so righteous and so jewish you think you have a right to come into the table just as you are right now but you're wrong the gentiles see even the bad ones they're going to enter in but you yourselves the cream of the crop you're not going to make it you're not going to make it and the and the gentiles entered in through the only door there is that's Christ himself. These guys were going to march right in outside of Christ. Okay. They did understand what he's saying. And less than a week later, they murdered him. They understood perfectly what he was saying. Okay. 
but just because, you, know, you know, so there's an application for us. See, see, you know, you have to have a wedding garment to get in here. And it's not one that you can provide for yourself. We, we understand that, okay. And so, I, you know, that uneasiness that I was talking about from the beginning, you see, it comes to the fact that, that we're inculcated with the idea that we have to provide for our own salvation now. Don't get me wrong. Then you know I'm not saying that God doesn't expect stuff out of us. I'm not saying that. But when we come up out of the water, that garment is on us. Come out, up, garment, wedding garments there, there. Okay, it's right then. See, and so and the reason you come up out, the reason you go on the water in the first place is because you don't think you're good enough. I'm not good enough to be saved, right? You feel that. Everybody feels that. I'm not good enough. I need somebody who's better than me to save me, and that somebody is obviously Jesus, right? So <clears throat> there's, you know, and so sometimes though we we out of habit we wonder if the garment that Christ gives us is sufficient covering or if something else is needed, what we miss some, you know, some small print or something. You know, remember last week, we were talking about those two nations that, that inhabit the same piece of real estate. They're in total conflict, right? Here we are. We know how that is. You know, you want to do something and then, and, but this other part of you goes, God didn't like that. <laughs> Don't do that. You know, quit that. Like that. You're, you're in conflict. You know, we have two nations in the same piece of real estate. That's going to quit, but it's this way right now. We're at war with ourselves. Okay. This is that. This is what we're feeling. See, the old man, the natural man, the man who, who knows he doesn't really belong at the table, he looks to provide for himself a covering. That's that guy that had the wrong wedding dress on. He thinks he's got himself covered. He can't. See, but it's a new man who goes, I got to stay locked on to Christ. He is my only hope. That's the new man talking. I can't do it myself. I already know I can't do it myself. It's got to be Jesus. See? And so, so the new man, he's looking at God with trust. He's going, uh, you know, Lord, you know, if I'm going to get in, because you're going to get me in. You know, not anything I ever did. And that's why, see, every good work you do, everything you do to, to, to do for Christ, that really belongs to Christ because it's all a result of him placing the wedding garment on us. All right? So everything we do isn't, doesn't really redound to our credit. It, returns, it redounds to the credit of Jesus who gave us the garment in the first place, who causes us to do right and turn away from wrong. Right? Okay. So all that credit goes to Christ. Not, not ours anyhow. We are already saved. So we have a birthright. We're in by birthright. So whatever we do is to the glory of Christ then, by birthright. So when you feel doubt, see, that's the old guy. That's, what we, that's the work we do. We're, we're still struggling against the old guy. It's hard because his eyes wiggle. He knows he doesn't belong there. Just like, you know, I know that really my proper home is to be condemned. But the new man believes in Jesus. And so that conflict goes on all the time. And so, you know, so what we want is for the new man to overcome the old man. But it's, it's a process. It's a struggle. Okay. That's where that is. That's what this, this is where I'm going with this. Now, it's not just the, it's not just the, the, the parable but it's that uncertainty that we feel when Christ calls us, why don't you just trust me? Oh, ye of little faith, like that, right? He says, trust me. You're born, you're in, you have your, 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 your wedding garment, so don't doubt. But instead, just engage. Go ahead and engage. Engage the, the fight with the old man. Know who he is and get rid, you know, fight him. You know, don't, don't let him give you doubts because the doubt weakens the new man. Doubt weakens him. And so you, you know, so that's why they defeat him by looking straight at your father in heaven who gave you his Jesus to save you. So the old man, when you experience doubt and fear and uncertainty, he's attempting to barter his way to the table. We talked about that. But the new man, you just trust God. And you, why do you do the will of the father? If you trust, well, because 
you're like father, like son. You know, I want to, I do want to do the law because Jesus wants me to. That's all. Am I going to be saved by doing it? I know better than that. That's not going to happen. You know, I was already saved too late. The law can't save me now. I've already been saved. All right. So anyway, uh, so what's happening, see, is the war. Just be conscious of the war. Uh, it is a war. You may be aware of just, and you should be just, a, you know, be aware of who you are. You're two people, you know, you're two nations inside right now, and we're fighting. And so uh, that doubt that comes into your mind, that's from the old, that's from the, that's from the old man of sin. And the one who looks to Christ and goes, Lord, uh, I get, things are kind of shaky, but you're praying to the Lord. Who's that? That's the new man. That's the new man praying. Now, now, the old man, he's going to die along with these bodies. That guy is done. All right. He may be very influential even up towards the end, but, but I, you know, normally what happens with Christians is the old man is already being crucified, is the way the, Christ, uh, the Bible puts it. You're crucified, and the new man is growing, and that's the way it's supposed to be. That's what I hope will be happening to us. But he's going to die. He's doomed. He's going to be purged from your being to the last corner. There's not going to be any of him left when we get resurrected. That guy's gone. He's dead already. He's still kicking, but he's dead. But we who are in Christ, we're alive. We're alive, and we can't die. Okay? And so, um, so now it's time for the invitation. All right? Now, God is God of the living, is what Jesus said, not the God of the dead. And so this is an invite to come, even if you're dead, to the God who gives life, who's the God of the living, not the dead. Okay, we're Benjamin. <clears throat>